So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Seiler and I am a board member for BCHS, Baltimore City Historical Society. Most of you probably have seen me running some Zoom rooms uh, this Baltimore History Evening season. So I'm happy to be here again and to be hosting this evening. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a rundown. Um, you know, we ask that you remain muted during the presentation just so that we can make sure we have our, our speaker's voice shared. Um, there will be a time at the end for questions and answers. So if there's a question that comes up and you'd like to ask it, feel free to put it in the chat um, or you can hold it until the end and you can unmute and ask uh, Dr. Tillman your question in person. Um, so thank you again for being here tonight. And if you have any issues, if for some reason you need some help with Zoom, feel free to send me a message. I'll be monitoring the chat and I'm happy to help. Um, Again, this is uh, our Baltimore History Evening. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike French to get us um, kicked off. Thank you very much, Allison. Welcome everyone to the sixth and final Baltimore History of 2021. I'm Mike French, Chair of the Baltimore History Evening Committee, who along with two other Baltimore City Historical Society board members, David Armenti, who is Director of Education at the Maryland Center for History and Culture, and Savannah Wood, who is Archives Director for the Afro-American Newspapers, uh, we're the folks who've put this series together. This evening concludes the 2021 series, and so that means now we start thinking about 2022. Those of us who put this series together have our fingers on a lot of pies, but we don't know everyone who is working on Baltimore history. We invite you to let us know if you or anyone you know might be working on a Baltimore history topic that is worthy of sharing with the Baltimore history community, that is, with you folks. Uh, we've been doing this since 2009, and we still manage to find people who are doing good work that is worth sharing. And we can certainly say this about tonight's speaker, Dr. John Tillman, who is an associate professor of history in, uh, in the Department of History and Political Science at Tuskegee University. And it gives me, oh, and I should say, uh, Dr. Tillman is the winner of the most recent Joseph Arnold Prize for Distinguished Writing in Baltimore History. Joseph Arnold, the late UMBC uh, professor was the the dean of Baltimore historians and the uh, Judge John Cale Burns family has endowed this prize in the memory of Joe Arnold and Dr. Tillman is the most recent winner of that. Uh, I generally give these real short introductions because you want to hear the speaker and I do too but I really just feel compelled to, to toot Dr. Tillman's horn a little bit because he is Baltimore born, raised in West Baltimore in the Panway Bradish neighborhood, and is a product of our Baltimore city and state public schools. He graduated from Walbrook Senior High School, he attended Baltimore City Community College, and he graduated from Coppin State University in 2005 with a degree of history. And he wanted to acknowledge many his many mentors at Coppin uh, some of these are names that will be known to you, uh, Dr. Roger Davidson, Dr. Cynthia Neverdon Morton, Dr. Betty Gardner, uh, Dr. Albina Lewis Moon, Dr. Douglas Reardon, the late Dr. Ibrahim Cargo, and Dr. Larry Martin. These are folks that have helped shape him. After Coppin State, he went on to get his master's and PhD from Howard University, the latter, the PhD in 2012. His dissertation called No Road for Renaissance, Black Protest and Downtown Baltimore, 1954-1977, and a manuscript based on that is under review by Temple University Press. Uh, he's got other publications I can mention here, uh, including uh, some articles of Baltimore interests uh, including Hiding Slavery in a Border City, Civil War Memory of Baltimore's Pratt Street. That was published in the Africological Perspectives, History and Contemporary Analysis of Race and Africana Studies 
in 2013. And I could go on and on and on, but you didn't come here for me, you came here for Dr. Tillman. So I invite Dr. Tillman, the, the screen is yours. Please okay. take it over. Greetings, thank you, thank you, Mike, thank you. Greetings, everyone, thank you for showing up. I'm just gonna share my screen and share my slide. I hope everyone can see this, there we go. I hope everyone can see this. All right, um, the title of my presentation is called The Show of Strange Such Seldom Seen, Black Busting and the Black Voting Block in 1950s Baltimore West Side as well. Uh, part of that title right there is taken out of a newspaper article that was reading by little Garrett Jones in the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper in 1958, which was highlighting um, the integration of Belvedere Hotel in 1958 by a group called Women's Power created by Victorine Adams. Uh, and of course, that's the picture with Victorine Adams right there uh, in her office with the young gentleman right there, the picture there at the bottom. And of course, the top picture, of course, is uh, 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 State Senator, at that time, State Senator Berta Welcome with Adam Clayton Powell. And I'll put these two pictures here because it kind of illustrates uh, a hidden history to the impact of block busting in Baltimore that I think that no one really actually talks about. Uh, I became interested in this topic mostly because I grew up in Baltimore City. Uh, I grew up in an area that was actually chained, that was blockbuster during the late 50s uh, in, in Panway Braddock's community. And I just became interested in this particular topic. Um, so, and I wanted to actually, I had a choice of which topic I want to talk about that I want to present it toward the paper prize. And I chose this one as well. So if I can just get into it, I just want to talk about what is my main argument. I feel that this is a very important topic to talk about. Granted that we've, um, as a nation, survived the 2020 election, or the aftermath of it, let's put it that way. We survived the aftermath of that. <laughs> And there's actually, you know, new laws being written in the South, particularly where I live in Alabama, throughout the South, that's really instigating voter intimidation, particularly trying to curtail uh, Black voting strength and, and other voting strength that is, uh, that uh, other groups of folks view as being non-legitimate yet very threatening. And it's funny, when we talk about uh, this issue of gerrymandering is very deeply tied to the impact of blockbusting, particularly here in Baltimore City. This right here is a uh, kind of a picture right here, a uh, come from the Baltimore Sun newspaper called 1958, and the title was called The Fourth District Outcome Seen Based on Negro Vote. And what you see right here is kind of a map of the Fourth District back in 1958. Um, and if you kind of look at it, you see this little, this little, um, uh, the arrow right here where it says, little tag, it says, Jax is a victim of the changing neighborhoods. And what the article we were really talking about was a political bar by the name of James H. Jack Pollock. And he's being challenged by independent Black politicians who are both Democrats and Republicans uh, in order to actually get uh, represent, Black representation for their district in the state legislature. And that term changing neighborhoods was really a term used to describe neighborhoods that underwent blockbusting that transition from white to black. Now when we look at blockbusting, again, it was a technique that was kind of used by many real estate speculators to actually, uh, for just to make a buck, to actually purchase homes from white homeowners and white neighborhoods. And they were actually able to buy these, buy these homes at a very, very low price below market value and then turn around and sell it to aspiring black homeowners and renters above the market value, which really, which really fleece many African-Americans in homes. Many of them, many of these black, uh, black homeowners do not gain access to regular housing loans that actually purchase homes in, into white neighborhoods. So of course they were giving what you call um, land, land installment contract, which was very faulty. So, you know, when you look at works such as W. Edward Orser's Black Busting in Baltimore, when you look at Inter Patel's book, uh, Not in My Neighborhood, 
one thing that they chronicle is that Baltimore became, they used Baltimore as the starting point to identify how is it that neighborhoods become racially surrogated and the impact of it becoming racially surrogated to this very day, particularly in older industrial neighborhoods like Baltimore City. And the work is, the work is, is very substantial, uh, you know, and, and it highlights that very well. They highlight that it was a huge mechanism of exploitation um, using racial scare tactics, financial exploitation, um, uh, particularly by black homeowners. But when you look at this particular, this, this, uh, this cartoon right here, you're seeing that there's a whole different aspect towards block busting that people don't really talk about. What you're seeing here, the block busting, the impact of block busting, is not only allowing African Americans to actually get access to homes and change the racial and class makeup of a neighborhood, where it's actually transcending into electoral politics. And it's really depending on what African Americans were actually doing in those neighborhoods that makes the difference. So my main argument pretty much, I just want to keep it plain and short and simple, that Black Baltimoreans through blockbusting actually utilized the population changes made in these neighborhood blocks to actually mobilize in terms of voter registration and turn out the vote to actually vote in black politicians. And while we're issuing that within the paper itself, and I'm still restructuring the paper as well because I want it to be more, more impact. Um, it actually served as some form of a, of a civil rights approach much more than it is just as exploitive. Also what it highlights is that not only were they able to challenge James Jack Pollock's machine, but what you see right now is that the fourth district, the fourth city district really became this battleground over electoral politics, not only on the city level, but also in the state level, which would include the fears of gerrymandering and everything else based upon the impact of blockbusting that happened by the early 1950s. So that's mostly my argument. What's my art for the day? Now, I want to show this map right here. This right here is actually a map of the Baltimore legislative map back in 1954. So if you actually look at the fourth district or the green area that's shaded, in the, that's shaded green, it said number four, that's actually the fourth uh, councilmanic district. For many African-Americans before 1945, they were mainly living in the 14th and the 17th ward that you see there. Uh, many up there, African-Americans were really not allowed to live in both in the 13th and part of the green part of that 15th ward because those were pretty much the, ra the, the racial barrier that he couldn't pass. So right above 14th ward is really North Avenue, all right? So those type of areas were pretty much, so you mostly had most of your black voters living in the 14th and 17th wards and majority white voters living in the 13th and parts of the 15th ward. And of course, most of it was due to re uh, restrictive covenants, not being allowed to purchase homes and those other wards. And also you're mostly looking at the fact that you're actually um, pinned into the 14th and 17th ward there. Now within, the, now, within this ward, during the 1950s, the, the man who pretty much control uh, the fourth district, a man by the name of James H. Jack Pollock. Uh, he was a Russian immigrant, Russian Jewish immigrant, came to America, been involved in uh, boxing, sports, and everything else. He may have been involved in politics, but you can't really talk about Jack Pollock automatically. Um, when you talk about Jack Pollock, you have to talk about the history of a democratic political machine and the kind of bosses that actually created these particular strategies in Baltimore City. Uh, many folks, you know, when you read about Baltimore, they always call it the mob town or um, political part like the no nothing or anything else, doing violence during, uh, during election day and everything else. By the 1870s, uh, things are very, very different. Uh, you really begin to see a democratic political machine criminal be, be created, mostly by, by Isaac Rasson and, of course, Arthur Poe, oh, I'm sorry, Arthur Pugh Gorman. And what you have here, you have the creation of what you call the political machine, where you really see Baltimore really play a role in determining elections, both in the city and in the state. And so out of this, you have what's called, uh, these are very traditional political bosses. 
and you look at very traditional political bosses, you're mostly looking at folks where we control the city, but you remain invisible. You're not really running for a high office. For example, uh, Rasson ran and was, and was elected as the clerk of the Court of Appeals, right? It's different, but he didn't go no higher than that. Arthur Pugh, of course, was a state legislator from, I believe, Howard County. Yeah, I believe Howard County, right? So, but then over time, this Democratic political machine pretty much expands. And you have the inclusion of Jason and Mahan, of course, uh, Frank Kelly, uh, Robert Patchett, Willie Curran, of course, and then you have James H. at Public coming in the 1930s. Now, um, it's always been documented that some of the tricks that have been used is that they actually form strategies kind of to either dilute or curtail Black voting strength, particularly in that 14th century ward. And you know, most of the things that were talked about were um, that Razin will actually, that Isaac Razin will actually have uh, a Black political boss by the name of Tom Smith, who was in charge of the 14th and 17th ward in the 4th District. And he said that, well, he would actually pay Smith to actually go out and bring Black voters out on picnics and barbecue on election day and have them have barbecues and kind of distract them from going to the polls. That's been a very popular thing to say. And it really very careful with that because when you look at it, uh, it, it tends to hint that black voters were not intelligent voters or may not be educated on civic duty. And it's kind of hard to believe because from the 1890s up to 1930s, you had six Republicans, men, or black men, voted who were elected into the city council. All right, and that was mostly curtailed. I think we have to do is understand that there were many, many strategies that were actually really used, actually really used to really curtail and challenge a lot of black, black votes. Number one, you have to understand this. If you're gonna have barbecues and picnics by the mouth, right, you would have to actually entice them to actually vote Democrat. You have to think that way. Another thing is, of course, you know, um, thing that Jack Pollock had been accused of doing was, you know, rumors of bribery, racist literature, everything else, uh, rigging elections, but those things were, already, were always being done. When you're a political boss, particularly in the 14th and 17th wards, those political bars pretty much have control over those election polls, and they can determine which votes can be counted, which votes cannot be counted. You know, those are the type of things there, right? But, you know, but it's very difficult to actually prove that because those things are not really documented. What you can say if you look at it is two things. One, redistricting and gerrymandering. Because understand something, when Baltimore, when the Maryland State Senate passed the Home Rule Amendment in 1923, Baltimore is given the, actually given the chance to actually redistrict its own lines in the city. And out of that, you begin to have the fourth district. So you have the 14th and the 17th Ward actually merge into other white neighborhoods in the 13th Ward, such as Wooden and Hampton area, and, and I'm sorry, Hampton and Woodbury, and parts of the 15th uh, Ward as well. So what you have here is that once, so what you have here is this, um, you took the 14th and 17th Ward and you actually merged it with an overwhelming amount of uh, white neighborhoods and white wards, and voila, that's what you had at the fourth at the fourth ward. So you know, and what you have here is this: you actually have a city where, or a ward where, the white population is more than than the black population. So even if the black folk come out to vote, it's still not really enough. To actually, the, the voting turnout will not be enough. Will not be enough to actually vote for. The politician that, that they actually want. Now, as they actually gerrymandered and redistrict most of the, 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 uh, the uh, DC districts, income political bosses, and most of these political bosses were able to come in and actually, and actually um, create certain tactics to really not allow uh, black politicians ever to get elected. Your last black city councilman was Warner T. McEwen in 1933. So before then, you never had a black person in the Baltimore City Council until 1955. You will not have, not ever have a black 
state legislator and the Maryland state government. So it pretty much never happened. So these were always tricks and tactics used to kind of disrupt black voting turnout in the fourth and 17th ward. So a lot of these things have happened. Now, here's the thing, within these wards, and what you have here were African-Americans who were involved in politics, who were actually involved in trying to challenge the political bosses. Some actually tried to work with them, of course. The first one, of course, was Thomas Smith, who was working with the Isaac Rising campaign. I mean, the Isaac Rising growing machine up to 1920s. Uh, he pretty much no longer becomes the political boss in the Black Fourth District. And then you had Laura Random called Little Willie Adams. This is a picture right here with wife Victorine Adams. And of course, you have the United Democratic Club. Many historians have already argued that Jack Pollock actually created that democratic organization with Laura Randolph. Other historians argue that it wasn't Jack Pollock, it was mostly Little Willie Adams, and, and, and it never involved Jack Pollock. But what you begin to see here is how are African Americans actually responding to uh, the lack of having a black, re black representation in the office that would actually meet their needs in their communities? One person who's also very important, of course, is Victorine Adams. She, of course, created the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee, where she's going out and doing the grassroots effort work, actually, to go out and actually um, not only do voter registration, but actually teach civic duties among folks and actually try to turn out the vote. So you have these folks as well. Other name I mentioned, of course, is Harry Cole and Carl Murphy, who are also supporting black politicians, mainly to actually challenge Jack Pollock's political machine. Another person that you have, of course, and is on my left is Mars Calloway. Mars Calloway, of course, was very different because he's actually a black Republican. He's a black liberal Republican. And he's a member of the Maryland Color Republican Voters League. He's forming his alliance with Theodore McKeldin. So now for him, he actually attempts to actually uh, run. And what Mark Keller does is that he actually attempts to run all black candidates on a Republican ticket for the city council, both in the 1940s, and they all lose. Most of it came from factualism because you had splits between folks who wanted to vote Democrat, folks who wanted to vote Republican. You also had issues with political bosses who were literally interfering in creating interference and actually getting them elected. But their stance pretty much between Mars Calloway, Lingra Coger, many of them had a very civil rights platform and a very reformist platform. So, you know, these things right here that you have the grounding for uh, the creation of independent black political politics it's going on in within this district, but it's very difficult to turn out, right? It really is. Well, in comes blockbusting. This right here is a census map that I have right here. If you go the top part, the northern section of the fourth district, uh, this is actually the 13th ward and part of the 15th ward. And I know people may not be able to see it clearly, but you may see this area right here. This is called Druid Lake, which is really Jewel Hill Park. And these are actually neighborhoods such as Mondalman, uh, Panway Bradish, uh, Cop and everything else. By 1945, you begin to see blockbusting begin to happen. And what, what you really see is that it happens and they are happening in certain places in South Border and certain parts in East Baltimore, but it's mainly happening in the West section of Baltimore City. You have African-Americans primarily and we always talk about the actors are always real estate speculators, no question about that. But there's other actors involved in this, mostly professional and middle-class African-Americans, black folks who are moving past North Avenue, moving past Fulton Avenue in Sandtown, Winchester. They're moving into neighborhoods such as Easterwood Park. They're moving in neighborhoods such as Mondawmin, Panway, Coppin Heights. And later, after 1955, it will be Ashburton and Everson Village. So when you look at the racial turnover in this census report by 1950, um, the African-American residents actually outnumber white residents in Easterwood Park by at least three to 5,000 residents. That's how quickly it turned over. This is beginning in 1945. This is by 1950. This is according to the census records. If you look at Reservoir Hill, 
Panway, Mondaman, at least, it increases by 13,000 black residents. Now, during this time period, Baltimore City is going through humongous change. It's an old industrial city. Its economy is shifting from manufacturing to tourism. You have downtown development going on, which will later become Charleston and a harbor. You also have the, the displacement of black residents that are living surrounding around the downtown area. You also have the civil rights movement going on there, particularly um, the slowly but surely your um, uh, segregation is slowly but surely being dismantled in certain areas, such as downtown restaurant and department stores slowly and education. You have it in housing, you have it in employment, you have city employment being opened up. So it's actually going through different changes. So you have middle-class African-Americans who are actually moving to these neighborhoods. But what you also got to look at is this, West Baltimore actually becomes the designated area for African-Americans. Uh, now, there's no law that's going to be passed against blockbusting. Well, mainly because the Supreme Court ruled that the covenants are, are illegal if the federal government is enforcing them. So you can't do that. So what you have here is that you have African-Americans who are actually Literally, it's free for them to move to these neighborhoods. In 1948, um, if you look at Thomas DeLisandro Jr., he come across a letter, I came across a letter of correspondence between um, Carl Murphy Jr. and Thomas DeLisandro about building a vocational high school in Eastwood Park. And that was called Carver Vocational High School in 1950. Um, of course, it was protested by white residents who were living there, but it didn't matter because black folks were already moving to those neighborhoods. Um, Frederick Douglass High School. I don't know if it's called Frederick Douglass High School now because the names have changed, right? That's actually used to be in the Sandtown Winchester community. Well, that moves. In 1953, it moves to where it's now across street from Mondawmin. Uh, this, where it says Metro Plaza, that's actually Mondawmin Mall. It's the original building, the original building. So that's in 1955. So what you have to argue here is that after, not only are African Americans move out of these areas, it's really designated for them. Now they're not going to pass a black busting, a black busting bill until 1958 or 1960. No, 1960, my apologies. That's when it happens. So when you have this, um, there's no question that when, when middle class African Americans are moving out of these neighborhoods, they're mobilizing many people to come out there and to vote. And they're showing their voting strength. Now Samuel Frieden was actually. Uh, elected to the U.S. Congress, all right? And when he's elected to the U.S. Congress, uh, a man by the name of Raymond, I'm sorry, a man by the name of Leon Raymond is requesting Thomas Del Sancho to appoint a black woman by the name of Vivian, Vivian Aline to the Bournemouth City Council. Well, Del Sancho kind of refuses. So Victory Adams and Willie Adams and the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee getting involved the NWCP is getting involved, the, N the Ministerial Alliance is getting involved, they, and Leonard Raymond actually formed a Plain People's Protective Association. And what he says is that he actually formed a group and they're petitioning for a black person in the particular, um, to sit at that seat and represent the fifth council matter district. Well, it opens a lot of eyes to many state legislators of uh, the changing neighborhoods that are going on in the fourth district. So State Senator Francis Dipple is actually forming a, um, he's actually requesting for a, a redistricting of the fourth district. And the argument that he says there is, he said, look, the population are actually changing in here and you mostly have to really redistrict so everyone can have an equal amount of representation in the state legislature. Now for mostly for, for this, right, and he's working with the, with, with the Citizens Committee for Redistricting. And right here's a picture from the Bournemouth Afro American newspaper. And it shows you the different plans. Um, these plans were actually presented, which you had here in 1953, was actually just actually well, this real scuffle of uh, elect, of um, redrawing the boundaries of the fourth district, and also including the third and the, third and the fifth district as well. Uh, when the Baltimore Afro-American finds out and many black political figures in the fourth district finds out, 
uh, they view it as gerrymandering. And they view it as, well, many people gerrymandering, that you're trying to manipulate the boundaries to make sure that not only Democrats win, but white Democrats maintain seat in office. So Harry Cole and Vincent Tubbs, this is actually Vincent Tubbs article right here. And they actually formed what's called the Ballot League of the Fourth District. And they're charging that Francis Dipple's uh, redistricting plan is really gerrymandering. So they're all offering their own plans of redistricting. And what's funny about Vincent Tubbs is this, he says, look, he actually creates a redistricting plan that says, make the fourth district as small as possible. He said, the only way you can have black representation in that fourth councilman district is if you keep it small, because when you look at the plans, the goal is that you're trying to integrate the fourth district into the fifth and the third district, which means that they're trying to actually dilute black, black voters. Now, this district plan actually does not actually come through, but what you see there pretty much is they actually see that what you're actually looking at here is this is really the impact of blockbusting. And what you're seeing is not only are these neighborhoods actually changing in terms of the population, but if you mobilize um, voter registration and actually have voting turnout, uh, the there is a possibility to actually elect someone on the state office level. And from there, you can try to create any civil rights legislation you can on the topic. So by 1954, uh, Willie Adams and of course, Carl Murphy Jr. in the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper actually supports what is for the first time this coalition ticket of both Democrats and Republicans. And this is pretty much he not heard of. And many people gawk at it because they said you'll actually cause political fractions if you mix Democrats and Republicans. So Harry Cole ran what's called this Republican Democratic Coalition ticket. He ran as for the, the state Senate against Bernard Melnikoff, who was Jack Pollock's senior politician. Emory Cole also ran as a Republican and Trulia Hatchet, the man in the middle, ran as a Democrat. They actually win. And of course, they become the first African Americans ever to serve on the Maryland State Senate and the House of Delegates. What, it, what you do not have come out is that it angers Jack Pollock and also angers Bernard Melnikoff. They actually protest the election. And Bernard Melnikoff has his lawyers. And he said, I want to examine all the voter authority cards. He accused them of, of what you call ghost voting, that you had people who were signing their names to more than two or three um, voter registration cards. He accused them of tampering with the polls. He accused them of all kinds of things. And, and again, he protested the election from November up to January. By January 1955, he had to contest, but he still said that he felt that uh, he felt that there was ghost voting involved and he wanted the Board of Election Supervisors to actually investigate it and everything else. Uh, now, there, there was no actually proof of that. Right, it really wasn't, but you know, you couldn't just, you know, there was no proof of that. However, you had to acknowledge that, look, the neighborhoods have changed. They ran a Democratic coalition ticket, now they've won. So what that does is this, even though we see their elections as high mark African-American achievement, what you see here now is uh, black politicians and black political figures can now actually challenge Jack Pollock's political machine. So that forces Jack Pollock actually to change his strategy. And he's going to have to gear up for the 1950 election. The first thing he does is that he hires this picture right here of Walter T. Dixon. Walter T. Dixon is now hired within the Pollock machine. And of course, he runs as a Democrat. He gets, in 1955, he gets elected. He's the first black person ever to serve on the Baltimore City Council since Warner T. McGowan, since the Great Depression. That's how long Pollock had control over the entire district. Now Pollock has to really sit down and really strategize how he's going to try and take back uh, the district itself. So he runs the integrated ticket. He runs J. Alvin Jones, like, Walter T. Dixon come out of the Cortez Peters Business Schools. J. Alvin Jones is black. He also runs as a Democrat, Mary Abrams, Mary Abram, I'm sorry, Abramson, mm, blah, excuse me, Mary Abramson and Soul Freeman, both Democrats. And it was called the integrated ticket. 
you know, and, you know, Jet, you know, it, you can see it as token integration, but you can also look at, this is the ticket of integration. This is the ticket of uh, inclusion. And it's very important to do this because during this time period, the civil rights movement is just taking off. So it looks kind of, you know, it looks con politically convenient for you to do that, All right? So that was there on one end. And what happens really is this, is that you can't really strategize that. And for Carl Murphy Jr. and Harry Cole, yeah, how you strategize that? Well, now you have to include the role of black women, particularly in the fourth district. And in my interview with Earl McKinnon is pretty much, how was it, they want to actually determine the to vote. And out of that meeting, according to Earl McKinnon, who was the member of Women Power, you had an organization called Women Power Incorporated. And this is a picture of them uh, integrating the Belvedere Hotel in 1958. This was very important because you had, um, you had at that time a city council in the fifth district, William Down Schaefer attending this very meeting. These were mostly black women who were registered voters. And what it was is this, is that with, with the former Afro-American newspaper and being the mouthpiece of the fourth district Democrat, I mean, political coalition ticket, it was documenting how many people women power were registering, how many people they were registering and everything else. I mean, and they were registering thousands and thousands of black men and women in the fourth district. And not only in the fourth district, but throughout the entire city. And what many politicians on the city and state level had to recognize is that the fourth district has a very powerful black voting block and you have to take it seriously, right? So on that end, this is where you actually get a uh, voter welcome. The fourth district coalition ticket now becomes even new. Um, for them, is different. Pollock has the integration ticket. Harry Cole has a coalition ticket. Now it's really inclusive. It was truly three black women. Um, Irma Dixon, of course, on the left, Berta Welcome, both of them ran as Democrats for House of Delegate. Another woman was named, uh, of course, was Bertha Winston, who ran for House of Delegate as a Republican. The rest of the ticket were all Republican men. Um, Republican black men, Harry Cole for state Senate, um, Daniel Spalding for House of Delicate, Emery Cole, and Harry Dixon. Here's the real problem, right? When the ticket is formed, uh, Irma Dixon shifts size. She was part of fourth coalition ticket. Now she stops and she shifts side and now she's joining the pilot ticket. And, <laughs> and Again, a lot of these things are being talked about in the Baltimore sign of Baltimore Afro, and they're using newspaper as mouthpieces against each other. Uh, Irma Dixon says that uh, the coalition ticket that Harry Cole and, and Carl Murphy Jr. is a part of is, quote, reverse racism, and Delisandro is a liberal, he's a New Deal liberal, he's a civil rights advocate, and he, she had to say all those things. Now, she's not missing Jack Pollock. You really can't do that because you'll ruin everything. There's no evidence to say that she was spying on the coalition ticket. You can't come up and say those things, but there's lots of implication that it does, right? And not only that, Jack Pollock is now writing editorials about how racist the fourth district coalition ticket is. The, is racist to run an all black ticket, right? So on election day in 1958, Verda Welcome is the only person from the fourth district coalition ticket actually to win an election. And we look at it, you know, we mentioned Roda Welcome being the first black woman or first woman in general to win a seat in the state house at the same year as also Irma Dixon. But she don't really get noticed because she's, I guess because she's part of the politic ticket. So, <laughs> and that's something that actually will we'll point it right there is that it actually, and when you actually look at this, it actually lays down some of the some of the, uh, the actual foundations of black low top politics in the in the fourth district. Now, in conclusion, there are a lot of limitations towards that black political ticket. First of all, there was limitation in black electoral politics. It was very few uh, politicians in the Baltimore City Council or in the Maryland State Senate that actually passed civil rights laws and legislations. 
even though Harry Cole passed him, and of course, Walter T. Dixon passed him as well in terms of housing, uh, employment, it didn't go through. They didn't have enough people and they couldn't muster uh, the, the, the political muscle to actually pass that legislation through. You won't see those policies, those, those policies come through until 1962 and 63, mostly due to protests uh, throughout the entire, entire state. But, and also, there's also class issues as well. If you look at this political ticket ran by Harry Cole, they're all black intellectual, black professionals, lawyers, teachers, doctors. It doesn't really, it didn't really have a labor perspective. It didn't have a working class or black working class or black poor agenda. Because during that time period, many African Americans were being displaced from their homes during urban renewal, right? But the one thing you can also say is this, is that you when you look at blockbusting, no one questions that uh, it, was ex it was very exploitive. No one questions that it set the standard in terms of creating racially surrogated cities that you have today. But the one thing you also have to say is that it really did transform urban places and spaces. It did give African-Americans, in many cases, um, new institutions. Yes, you had access to housing, even the housing were older or much more newer and had more lighting than the ones in the inner cities. And also it actually got people, it actually allowed them actually to allow to elect black politicians. What you also get is this fear among the white political establishments of how powerful black voting turnout is. And you see some of the strategies that comes about when trying to stifle uh, those, those, those votes. Um, it does lay into foundations today. When we look at it today, um, in terms of what many people want to do in terms of packing and cracking uh, people into gerrymandering lines as well. So uh, that's my, the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening and I'll just stop right there. Thank you. I'll start with giving you a round of applause, John. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that was really enlightening and I, I think, uh, we're ready for you know a conversation. So um, I didn't see any questions come in the chat, but if there are folks that would like to unmute and ask John any questions, um, you can feel free to do so. Um, I'll just kick it off with a with a question about um, that I like to generally ask uh, the scholars and historians that um, come and present for us. Uh, I know you mentioned um, chatting with Mike and I before listening to some oral histories, but I wonder if you could tell us uh, a little bit more about the sources that you uh, were able to look at, what archival records you know you consulted in your research and maybe what you felt was the richest uh, sort of trove of, of documents. Yeah, the arc, well, first I did oral history interview when I was writing my dissertation at Howard University. And it was years ago, back in 2008, 2009, um, I was actually learning about Pennsylvania Avenue because, uh, you know, my grandfather was Charles P. Tillman. He was on the space building Pennsylvania Avenue. And I wanted to get just a history of that from many of my elders who were still around as well. And, but as I did the research, I started unraveling these connections between people moving out of Upton, Sandtown, Winchester, and moving into you know, the population change between these neighborhoods moving into other neighborhoods across into Easterwood Park and Mondawmin. So I tried to track down these people the best way I could. My older brother, uh, Charles Tillman Jr. helped me out a lot in locating them as well. I was actually able to interview, uh, I'm not sure if she's still living the day, she may have made a transition, Miss Earl McKinnon, who I've interviewed her, who actually lived down the street from me. I didn't know that she did. Um, and she was one of the people who actually formed Women Power with, uh, between Adams and Ethel Rich. So, and she began to give me just insight of what Women Power was doing, the impact that they had, tell me what would it like to actually uh, integrate the Belvedere Hotel, um, you know, and so her, her interview, cause that was actually very missing. So I use her interview as much to actually get a, a good rich source. There were other people I interviewed well, in terms of Carlton Douglas years ago. Uh, yeah, Carlton Douglas, The Undertaker as well, uh, whose I think his father was Calvin T. Douglas. Um, and Calvin T. Douglas sold my grandfather the house I grew up in. 
That's what he told me. Um, and who I think was also a politician as well. Other people who I interviewed was the late Clarence Mitchell III, uh, Michael Mitchell, his brother. Those, of course, were the sons of Clarence Mitchell Jr. and Juanita Jackson Mitchell. Um, also, in terms of archival work, dig into the archives, I've also looked at the old histories at, I want to say, Maryland Historical Society, but y'all changed your name. Is it the Maryland? Okay, Merlin Center Society. for History and Culture. Okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I, I, I had to change my um, my footnoting in my uh, in my manuscript when I saw that. But y'all had the Theodore McKeldin, Lily Carol Jackson Civil Rights Documentation Project, which I really utilized as well. Um, the issue of class that really got me was the one that Juanita Jackson Mitchell did, which really highlighted that as well. Just certain nuances. Um, so that work, of course, there was an oral history done by Willie Adam as well. And also just other books I was reading. Um, I, I was reading um, Hayward Farrar's book, The Afro-American Newspaper. Uh, but uh, what else I was reading? And just other books as well I was reading. Of course, um, Mr. Patilla's book, who's in today. How you doing, sir? I was reading his books as well. Um, just secondary sources that helped me kind of put things kind of together. And also find what was actually available. Right. So those were the those yeah. were the that I used. Thank you so much. That's really uh, helpful. And I know for a lot of us, you know, who are trying to get started in research or want to go down certain research paths, it's helpful to kind of figure out how to make those connections. So thank you for that. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like to unmute and ask? Yeah, I have one. Sure, go for it. Thank uh, you. Yeah, my name is John Murphy. Uh, you know, I'm a white person. And uh, from our perspective, we always learned that blockbusting is a terrible thing. Yeah. Uh, that uh, it forced the uh, white people basically out of the city uh, through threats of uh, uh, decline of property values and so forth. And they really amounted to the reason for the white flight that uh, the history books say is sort of the big change in Baltimore City. And it seems to me that you're proposing a somewhat different perspective and one that I had never thought of before. And that is, is that from a reverse standpoint, from the standpoint of African Americans, uh, blockbusting uh, opened up areas that uh, had not existed before for them to live in, not just, I guess, in living quarters, but also in political power. And is that correct? Yeah. Uh, I would say, you know, I understand your question. And I would say, I would say yes. I was, I was, first of all, I would say yes, it did. Yeah, yes and no. How, how I always view butt busting is that it's, it's, it's very complex. And there's a lot of contradictions to it. Because um, on one end, look at block busting, um, you're, you're really exploiting uh, white Americans on their racial fears of having black, neighbor, having black neighbors and then they move out towards the suburbs. And you also exploit black aspiring homeowners and renters uh, by moving them into homes. Some homes are decent, some homes maybe subpar. And then next thing you know, you know, uh, they're living in substandard housing. Uh, that's one area. On another end, was the, the, the another decent part about that, which you're trying to allude to is that the positive part about it, I don't, I have, I'm very careful how I craft this. I'm trying to word it well, but um, the contradictory part about it is that you actually begin, it actually contribute to the political empowerment of many professional and middle-class African-Americans, not just in gaining homes, however, but also to, but exactly, but actually to elect people in office. So, you know, I, I don't want to come out and say it's a great thing. I, I don't want to do that, uh, you know, but I, I do say this is that 
you can't you can't look at blockbusting as right or wrong. Yeah, and, and that's how to say because you know, for many people who argue, they said that well, blockbusting does promote segregation. Okay, it does, and those who have a liberal integration perspective would not would not agree with blockbusting because not only are you exploiting white American black homeowners, right? Uh, you you resist the chance of actually creating integrated neighborhoods for for people who are for people who are not of their liberal integration view. For African Americans who are deep rooted in Black politics, their idea is that we're really not interested into um, forming interracial neighborhood. That's fine if you want to, but for many, for us, really the goal here is not only to have access to good neighborhoods and better homes, but also we see an opportunity to actually have political representation to actually change the communities that we are living actually living in. And that's really one of the purposes of, of, of engaging in block busting that, that you actually see, not just in Baltimore City, but also in other cities as well. So I hope I answered your question, Mr. Yeah, thank you. I have another Thanks, question. It's, it's sure, go ahead. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, Don Hutchinson the other day, and he was a uh, Congressman, I think, and County Executive of Baltimore County. And he was talking about the uh, political clubs in Baltimore County. And he said that they existed solely for the purpose of providing jobs. He said that was the only reason they existed. And he said they had a political club on just about every block because people were interested in the jobs. And I go back to the 60s in Baltimore City, and I can remember walking into the courthouse in Baltimore City and really never seeing a black in any uh, administrative jobs. You know, they, they, all the clerks and everybody else were white. There weren't any blacks in there at all. And uh, maybe the, maybe the, the uh, uh, city hall was different. But I wondered what was what was driving the political forces of uh, the political power. Why would they do this in Baltimore City? Were they getting jobs? What what was what was the payoff of the of the uh, political activity? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, when you look at political bosses, particularly if you go back to Isaac Freeman Rassin, uh, for them, when you get involved, when you control city and city and state politics, uh, when you put in your own politician, they were really involved in getting in governors and state legislators. Uh, mostly you have what's called patronage jobs. They actually took your jobs out to those who actually helped and get votes out for them. So what you look at is, what you're actually looking at is, is that these are actually people who are political kingmakers. I mean, they can act, the goal is actually putting people in office. And also they actually distribute out patronage jobs. Now, um, mostly these patronage jobs, they can actually enrich themselves, enrich their families, enrich their friends, pretty much. And then you have other folks who are actually part of their political machines. And, but by the 1940s and 50s, what you really have here Technically, after Isaac, after Isaac Rasen is dead, you really don't have those citywide political bosses in Baltimore anymore. Jay Mahan, Frank Kelly, even Jet Pop, they never really controlled city politics, the entire city politics like that. You had other little bosses. Um, you had Irv Cove in the fifth district. I believe they have what, George Della in, oh goodness gracious, I, I forgot the district is South Baltimore. William Willie Curran, yeah, most of these folks, most of it was actually being a king maker and getting people elected. Um, I'm not gonna go into, um, I'm not gonna go into um, uh, um, underground economies or illegal jobs or anything like that because I have no idea about that and there's no documentation of it. And if not document, I can't go there. But that's what I can really say. What I can say for Baltimore also is this, is that uh, those type of job, you know, those political bosses tend to end. When Jet Polly dies in 77, uh, that type of, well, 
you know, for Jack Pollock, a number of things happened. Uh, for him, people tend to turn on him in the 1950s and 60s, mostly because he was always in the newspaper. So people knew who he was. Usually they don't, usually they don't know who political bosses are, right? But when you're in the newspaper, they know who you are. Then when he dies, you know, uh, those political bosses tend to kind of split a bit. White flight and the fact that Baltimore becomes a majority black city is really what put it into that type of political bossery in Baltimore City. Also, the city kind of changes because now the people who are very influential in politics and policy are now public private partnerships, corporations, business, you know, and you kind of see that with the William Down Schaefer administration and, and everything else, you know, you know, certain business people who were very, very powerful in his administration in terms of downtown development and everything else. So those those policy, those political bosses really don't exist. But um, but most of it mostly is to distribute jobs and risk themselves, everything else, and have political clout and be that political team maker. So I hope I answer your question. I don't mean to be long with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, I also just wanted to point out a couple of things that came up in the chat. Um, Thanks to Linda Shopes for recommending uh, Ed Orser's Blockbusting in Baltimore book, which I'm sure John, you know, used, um, but might be helpful for others mm -hmm. to understand. Um, you know, uh, Ed Orser makes the point that uh, though blockbusting was deeply exploitative, it was an avenue to home ownership for African Americans when other opportunities were not were simply unavailable. Um, and then I just also wanted to give you this. Uh, kudos comment from Michael who had to leave a little early. He said the presentation was great. I want to contribute to the conversation but have a huge deadline to work on tomorrow and have to leave. Um, I can always put him in contact with you, John, if uh, you guys want to chat. He said he's been working along Greenmount Avenue, renovating homes and carrying out other neighborhood improvements. He said um, with the resident board of directors, the presentation has been enlightening. Thank you, Dr. Tillman. Okay. Um, so just just a heads up that I know there is a lot of um, there's a lot going on around the city de development and, and all sorts of things. Um, so it's it I'm sure that some of it is hitting in these areas too. Um, Mike, you had a question for Dr. Yeah, Chapman? well, part of one is a, a comment just feeding off of this. I remember when the uh, the BCHS had our uh, when we had annual spring conferences. Uh, we were in the Reginald Lewis Museum, and uh, Antero was one of the pre presenters. His book hadn't been published yet. And an elderly uh, African-American woman in the audience put up her hand and said, you know, we had a gold sucker house that they bought. And we know we, we paid, uh, you know, more for it than maybe we should, but it was a good house. He didn't sell any crap. And we were proud mm -hmm. of that. Remember that right, Antero? That, uh, Anecdote. I also saw some nodding from Linda, so she yeah. must have known too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, um, you know, in Torn Baltimore City, they up I grew up in Panway, Bradwich. You know, the house I grew up in is very spacious. There's a lot of window, there's lighting. I had a lawn, I had a backyard, everything else. But when you travel back into housing to the fourth district where it's like tenement houses you see that it's not that much lighting, it's very compact and everything else. So you can understand why African-Americans wanted or did everything they could to get a house out there. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. My, my other question I was thinking when you're maybe bouncing off Allison's question on sources and oral history, I wonder, do you ever, did you talk to your parents or grandparents about their experience in Baltimore? Yeah, I talked to my father and my uncle uh, my father is Charles Tillman Sr. My uncle is Wilbert Randolph Tillman. Uh, I interviewed them both together, actually. My oral history set is actually back at my father's house at, at Windsor Avenue, unfortunately. But, you know, I interviewed both of them together and they talked about their childhood growing in East Baltimore, um, uh, going along Pennsylvania Avenue, and actually moving out into purchasing homes into the neighborhoods. My father it would get because we grew up in the Panway uh Bradish community. My uncle, um, of course, used to live out into Emerson Avenue at uh Emerson Village. 
So, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, and, and, and they, you know, and they talked about that and how they actually enjoyed it because what they were telling me was that for many African Americans in the 1950s, um, neighborhoods like Ashbury, they, they were called, you know, the new world. That's what they call it, right? And the new world was like, uh, the new world was like um, Ashburton, Panway, uh, Mon Dolman, Warburg Junction, you know, because that was new to them. They were used to the tenements. And as they, you know, both in that generation, when they move out there, Ashbury, it was, I mean, you know, it was to them. Uh, my grandfather moved out to what's it called, Stratsmore and Northwest Baltimore, Stratsmore Avenue. I know Willie and Victory Adams moved into Ashburton across the street from, well, it's the reservoir, but back then it was called Lake Ashburton, the reservoir. And that's where the house they had there. So yeah, I mean, you know, when given a chance, folks talk very, very highly of those homes. Now, people actually want to move out into those particular homes, you know. You know, and they actually describe it being much better and much different than the ones in the fourth district. Well, certain parts of the fourth, like Upton, uh, Madison Park, et cetera, you know. Speaking of Ashburton, there's going to be a Juneteenth uh, tour of 10 Ashburton houses that are being open to the public. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just saw the article in the sun about that, Mike. Thanks for um, pointing that out. Uh, did we have any other questions from folks? Um, I saw Deborah, I know you were unmuted for a second. Did you want to go ahead? Sorry. I just want to give a quick shout out to my yeah. wife. Rashida Fareed, my apologies. My, 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 I just want to give oh, a quick that's okay. shout Rashida Fareed Tillman right there. We newlyweds. So <laughs> I just want to say that. And thank you. She, she saw the presentation and approved, so she be good. <laughs> I, I didn't know who she was, but I saw that she was listening intently. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. Okay, fair. Interesting okay. talk. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, man. Yeah, yeah Deborah, if you want to chime in. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, if the Afro, when you read the through the Afro, did they have a, did they make this connection between blockbusting and politics or is that something that you see a pattern in reading back into it? Oh, that was something that I saw as a pattern, just piecing these things together. And what you really look at, the border my Afro was mostly involved in it because uh, Morris Goldsecker, and, and it, it wasn't just Morris Goldsecker, it was so many other um, people who were engaged in blockbusting. And anyone who read uh, Interpretelli Patelli's book, you can read the first 100 pages, you see that. They were literally putting ads in the newspaper in the Baltimore Afro. Also, uh, the Manning Shaw Realty Company was also putting ads in there, and they would actually write very favorable, um, very favorable articles of these folks. They wrote very favorable articles, particularly of the Manning Shaw Realty Company, and uh, oh, I forgot the brother's name that fast who owned it. And, I, it, and his name escapes me unfortunately, but um, he had his real estate. He was one of the owners of the Manning Shaw, oh, Warren Shaw, Warren Shaw. He was one of the realtors who owned the Manning Shaw um, real estate company. And when he started passing the block busting laws in 1960, they revoked his real estate license. So, and the Afro wrote how it was a travesty or what, everything else. And they wrote very glowing articles. So they're mostly involved in Blockbusting itself. They're working hand in hand with uh, house speculators. Also, the Baltimore and NAACP. You know, remember, Bolton Hill was very segregated, and that was very close to the downtown area. So, until Lily, Lily Mae Carol Jackson and them tend to move, and many Black residents tend to blockbust Utah Place at Linden Avenue, that little middle section right there. Um, and they live alongside uh, the former. Judge who passed away, I interviewed him, uh, Thomas Ward. So they all live in that little area right there. So, you know, the Boma, the Boma Afro American newspaper and the NAACP, which is the mouthpiece of the Boma NAACP itself, because Carl Murphy is one of the legal redress on the board. Um, they're writing favorable reviews of block busting. Um, they are writing, they're advertising which houses to buy in which neighborhoods. 
um, and everything else. So, you know, they're actually a part of it. And once I started reading the articles, I started piecing together. And I also started reading, uh, you know, um, reading the Sun newspaper and the Apple newspaper and how they both serve as propaganda pieces for these elections that were going on in these changing neighborhoods. And I, I, I kind of figured that out as well. So that's something that I'm, you know, that's something that I'm actually working on in restructuring and making the people more impactful for in a way, so. Hmm. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, you know, this discussion, you know, it's, it's, we can talk about black and white, but the white population also was, you know, more, it's a, you know, not just a racial population, but it's an ethnic and religious population that was involved in a lot of these communities. And did they, was there much discussion, say, in the Afro or amongst black politicians that the, you know, the Jack Pollock was Jewish, that many of these other people were Jewish, that they were, you know, Jews who are often moving out? Yeah. And, and you have to really distinguish, you know, you have professional uh, Jewish Baltimore, and then all, and again, also you have poor Jewish men as well. Um, the one thing that I want to put more emphasis on is the class issue, and as well, because you know, if you really look at it, and historically, when Black folk were forced to migrate to certain neighborhoods, uh, they were mostly forced to migrate to Jewish neighborhoods as well. And again, anyone who understands the history of that, uh, Jewish Baltimoreans were subjugated to um, um, the Gentlemen's Agreement. Again, you could not move into Wooden Hampton. You could not move into Roland Park. Um, even though they moved to Ashburton, they couldn't get into Ashburton like that. I forgot the man's name, but he actually constructed the home in Ashburton community. And he talked in front of Baltimore City Council. He says that the, the, uh, the German agreement was a good thing, you know, and of course, but by that time, black folks and Jewish America were already moving out to particular areas. Now, um, in many cases, they're mostly Jewish Americans, Roman Catholics who are also living in Emerson Village in part of West Baltimore. They particularly moved out. And one thing in my research that I covered, it was much more easier to move into what's called a, uh, a, a Jewish neighborhood, particularly a poor Jewish neighborhood, uh, you know, a professional class Jewish neighborhood than you could move into East or Southwest Baltimore because East and Southwest Baltimore was pretty much uh, Italian American, uh, Southern immigrant, white Appalachian immigrants. Even though you had white Appalachians living among black folks in other neighborhoods like Bolton Hill and other sections, um, Southeast Baltimore was really very racist, very white supremacist area, particularly Canton and Fells Point, uh, are, and, and, and and also Locust Point as well. Um, remember the National Association for the Advancement of White People was started in 1955 after the public schools were integrated by Charles Lundriff and Brian Bowles from Delaware. So those certain sections, particularly when you integrate in South, Southern High School, it was not good to move in a particular, even though you live in Sharp Linden Hall, you could not, it was best not to go into those particular areas. If you move to West neighborhood, West Baltimore areas, you weren't going to have any violence like that. It was definitely, you don't have protests, it wasn't going to be violence. So they mostly just move out and, and most Jewish Americans move into other, other areas such as Liberty Heights, Park Heights, et cetera. But also among many poor Jews, they most, some many have stayed there. Remember, if you look at the 14th and 17th war, historically that was a Jewish neighborhood. You had Jewish temples there. And by the 1880s and 1890s, when black folks moved to Drew Hill Avenue and were permanent, um, those institutions, you know, those institutions were converted to churches, and then uh, the Jewish residents left those particular areas and moved somewhere else in the inner city. Um, but in many cases, you did have poor whites, particularly Appalachian whites and poor whites, poor Jews actually living there with black folks in many areas of the of the fourth district. Uh, that's something that actually not talked about. Also in Ashburton, when Ashbury was undergoing its racial change, Air Force Rosen and Samuel T. Dan Daniels, who was president of, who was also served as himself, they were actually next door neighbors. So Air Force Rosen knew that block busting was a major problem. And of course he wrote that article in the Saturday Evening Post 
trying to promote integration and everything else uh, to, to offset um, white flight. And of course, you had the Baltimore Neighborhoods Incorporation created in 1958. And it's funny, folks said that they, Baltimore never had a, a discussion about race, but they actually did in 1958 with these changing neighborhood situations. And what they realized was that, you know, okay, there's certain areas that were racially integrated where you did have black folks and um, they had it there. So, and they went door to door, tried to convince um, white residents to stay in their homes, but it really didn't work out. <laughs> they got, and they moved out anyway. So, I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so it, it really didn't work out. So um, that's something that I actually want to explore even more. But most of these areas really pretty much became mostly black and Boma really became very, very segregated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I ask you a question. Yeah, thanks so much for that, John. Um, I did want to ask you one more question that came into the chat. Um, and actually, I'm going to combine it a little bit uh, with a comment from um, one of our uh, regulars. Um, so one of the questions was about the uh, oral histories that you have done, um, whether or not those are video recordings, just audio recordings, or if you were sort of doing um, just interview in more informal interviews and, and taking notes uh, for your research. And then along with that, um, you know, is it is it your intention or your hope maybe in the future to deposit those interviews or share copies of those interviews with uh, with a repository, you know, with a an archives or something like that? Yeah, I, I will make sure to doing so most of them are actually tape recorded. Um, and, you know, again, those were done when I was in grad school. And, you know, when you're a grad student, you don't really have the funds to have the video camera and all those other things, you know, so I had, a, I had a digital tape recorder and a microphone and I had to do the best that, that I could with that one. But um, those were very, um, they're still back in Baltimore City and they should still be good. And I do, I do have plans of donating them to an archive later on in the future. Um, I just want the COVID-19 to kind of pass, hopefully, I, I don't think it will pass anytime soon, but you know, hopefully it will pass. And then once I retrieve them, I'll find a, a suitable archive to donate them to as well. So people can yeah, and I would I would say too, like any of us, you know, from the City Historical Society can help with that. I know, um, you know, Ida might be interested. Um, I don't want to speak mm -hmm. for her, but that could be a great repository um, to consider. So. Um, does anybody have any other uh, final questions for John? Did I see Heather having her hand up? I was actually going to pass the mic to Heather um, if nobody else has any questions just for a minute. Um, but I'll just ask one more time. Any other questions? Um, I have a comment, not a question. Can you hear sure. me? Sure. Yes, okay. we can. Uh, John, this is uh, Betty Gardner. Oh. Hey. <laughs> John, John is a former student of... Uh, of mine and my other colleagues at, at Coppin State, and I just wanted to say that um, I, um, Dr. Jones, Ida Jones, um, sent me the information, thank goodness, for this evening, and I was able just to, you know, get on. I heard your presentation, and uh, I'm, you know, it's just amazing. It's wonderful. Okay, so... Um, uh, just to hear you uh, tell this story uh, is interesting. And I will just add that many, many, many moons ago, um, when Joe Arnold, for whom this award is, uh, is named, um, Betty Collier Thomas, a uh, friend and, and colleague who was at uh, UMBC for a little while, uh, but we did uh, dissertation work on Baltimore, uh, 19th century, and uh, we were very active in the um, Baltimore History Group. Uh, the only other name that I recognized was Michael French, so I see he's still around. But anyhow, I just wanted to uh, say hi to you, John, and uh, and keep up the good work. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Gardner. Hello.
Betty, Betty, I don't know if you were here earlier on, but you were mentioned in a list of shout out people that, that John gave me as important mentors to him. Well, no, I was not. I, I mean, my goodness. Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> You'll have to watch the videotape. Yeah. Oh, it's always good to get a shout out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> and thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for your questions and everything. Um, I just want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge the BCHS uh, board president. So Heather, I'll turn it over to you um, to just say a couple of thank yous and, and whatever else you'd like to add. I think you might be frozen. Yes. Um, well, first, yes. Thank you to Dr. Tillman for joining us and for uh, um, I wanted to thank you, Dr. Tillman, for joining us and uh, for sharing your expertise uh, this evening. And we're really grateful for that um, and for having this great way to uh, close out the 2021 uh, lecture series. And I wanted to uh, make mention of uh, two, our two sponsors for the lecture series. Um, we have Arcadia Publishing, um, which is the nation's leading publisher of books of local history and local interest. Um, so this is a great um, partnership to um, for them to have with us. And they also were the publisher of um, Philip Merrill's uh, book on Old West Baltimore. And he was also, um, he was a speaker earlier on in the 2021 series. Um, and then also Trace Architects, which um, full disclosure, I am one half of a, uh, Trace Architects. Um, but we, um, we work uh, to help revitalize uh, neighborhoods through architecture. And um, Michael, who left the comment earlier, is someone that we work with with a People's Homesteading Group. Um, so we're really happy to be able to um, support the BCHS um, with our sponsorship. So if anyone um, knows of a business that would like to sponsor us in the future, um, we would love that. And then also, as Michael um, said earlier in the, in the uh, the evening. If you have any ideas and thoughts for um, topics for future uh, history evening talks, we would love to hear them. And we are um, working on something for this October um, to do. Um, we're working on expanding the history evenings out of its January to June time frame. And so we've got something scheduled for the fall um, as a little bonus um, hopefully a book talk that we'll be doing with uh, Doors Open Baltimore and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. So uh, thank you again. And um, I'm really happy. I'm glad I could make it tonight. I was almost going to be camping. So this is good. I get to see it live instead of a recording. And we should also mention that Baltimore City Historical Society is, is available to you 24 seven in our Facebook page which often has, you know, lively discussions of Baltimore history. And uh, uh, sometimes, you know, always lively, uh, usually informed, sometimes not. And uh, we could use more participation from people who really know Baltimore history. So invite you to, to check us out if you're on Facebook. So I guess with that, Mike, um, we can just give a virtual round of applause to Dr. Tillman. Thank you again so much for uh, your can unmute so he can. Yeah, you can unmute applause. and applause. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so very much. You, you've been a, just a very fine thank you so uh, much. closing hitter for our, uh, our, our 2021 series. <laughs> and, uh, you can find his paper on the Baltimore City uh, Web uh, Historical Society's uh, web page. You can actually do this old fashioned thing called reading. It's really a great way to, uh, <laughs> to learn things. And so, uh, and just my, my uh, the final thing I always say is, you know, that there's sort of two parts to this, uh, this, this kind of thing. It's the, the people who put it together and the people like Don, Dr. Tillman who speak, but it's also you, the audience, when we started this in 2009, we visualized this as kind of a two-way thing, uh, that public history is not just, you know, historians talking to people, but people being there. There would be no Baltimore history evenings without scholars, but there also would be no Baltimore history evenings without people turning out 
and to participate in that dialogue of Baltimore history. So thank those of you who are here for the first time or your faithful attendance uh, for making all this possible. Thank you very much. You make it happen. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much.